have faith in God. But that's not anything new, is it? Do we just have faith in God because we're a little apprehensive about things? I'm hoping, I'm trusting that every one of us have faith in God for everything that has gone on in our lives, is going on right now, and continue to have faith in God for the things that are yet to happen. Have faith in God. Yesterday, I don't know how many, well, not just yesterday, in the past several days, I have been amazed by all the conversations, text messages, phone calls that I've received about the coronavirus. And I realized yesterday, particularly with a, a message that I got from a friend, and this has got a lot of people scared, and rightfully so. I'm not trying to undermine this, okay? I realize that it is something serious, and only God knows where it's going to go. Only God knows how this is going to end. The coronavirus has thrown our state, thrown our nation, thrown our world into a cyclone of fear and chaos. Stock markets all around the world have lost trillions of dollars just here in the past few weeks. What originated, and I believe it's pronounced Wuhan, China, has now spread to over a hundred countries in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and even North America. Thus far in my life, I've never witnessed anything like this. I've never witnessed anything like this. And I'm not that old, but I'm not that young either. You'll never hear me admit that, okay? Take that off, okay? You can cut that one out, okay, Jess? But Friday night, Karen and I had the privilege of having dinner in Louisville with Sarah and her husband, Tyler. We went to Kroger's afterwards, and I was amazed. I've never seen, I've never seen the shelves wiped clean like they were. If you wanted any hamburger meat, you weren't going to get it there. Any sausage, bacon, you weren't going to get it there. If you wanted eggs, there was a dozen eggs in a container. I don't know why they were still there. Probably weren't good. And then there was a pack of six eggs, four of which were broken. That's all they had in the way of eggs. And paper items... Forget that. Well, I was amazed by all of that. I just, I just looked at Karen and said, I've never witnessed anything like this. And, and I guess yesterday is when it really hit me. We're living in fear. Um, a lot of people are living in fear. I asked one of the, the workers there that was stocking one of the produce that had run out. And I said, I, I just never seen anything like this, ma'am. I mean, what are you all going to do? How long will it be before y'all get the, st the shelves stocked? I thought that they were bare because of the past few days. She said, oh, no, we'll stock tonight. They'll be totally stocked by in the morning at 6 o'clock. And then we open the doors at 6 o'clock. And there's a line of people out there waiting to get in. And they come and grab all this stuff. Well, I can see grabbing necessary items. I guess my problem is, well, why are we grabbing up so much that we're taking away from others who may not be able to be there? And many of you have gone there only to find out what you went to get was not available. You see, this, this virus has gone viral. It's everywhere. But guess what else has gone viral? Our fear, our worry. It's gone viral. Everybody. Well, maybe not everybody. But people everywhere are now dealing and worrying with 
this fear. Now, as your pastor, as a shepherd of the flock, and this morning I got all kinds of texts from pastors that are in prayer groups, and we were texting each other and about things that are going on in their church and what they're doing and what they're not doing. We're all concerned. Every one of us as, as pastors are concerned about their flock and the sheep in their flock. Where do we go from here? How do we tell you all what to do? Well, first of all, I don't know the, I don't know the next step. I have no idea. Only God and all of his sovereignty and all of his wisdom and knowledge knows how all of this is going to unfold. Someone in the 9 o'clock service said, the only thing close that I can remember in my life to experience into what we are experiencing now is the polio epidemic. Now, by the time I was born, polio had already been uh, pretty much eradicated, or at least was in the process. Most of you know that my father had polio. He wasn't born with it, but he had polio and dealt with it all of his life. But outside of that, and I only know a little bit about that, I remember lining up in line as a little kid and them giving me that shot in the arm. And probably many of you all that's my age, which is 40-something or more, will we'll have uh, that, uh, why are y'all laughing about that? Uh, we'll have that, that little marking uh, on your upper arm, signifying and indicating that you have had that polio vaccination. But what are we supposed to do? What, what do we as Christians, what do we as a people of faith do? How do we respond? Do we just wallow around in fear and say, oh my, I don't know what I'm going to do? Or do we exercise our faith? Now one of the things we talk about at church all the time, it may be Sunday morning and preaching, it may be Sunday night, it may be in Bible studies, in Sunday school classes. We're all talking about faith. We're all talking about faith. And we're all talking about how to exercise our faith. Now, we can talk about faith. You can tell me all about your faith. You can tell me you've got bucket loads of faith. That really doesn't mean a thing to me. I really don't think it means anything to God. If you're not willing to step out in faith and exercise that faith. And I really believe that that's where we are for the biggest part right now. We place our faith in a number of people. We place our faith in a number of things. We believe that our legs will support us when we jump out of bed in the morning. That's why we jump out of bed. And we believe that our brakes on our vehicles will work when we go around curves. And in Owen County, there's a few of those, okay? We believe that our bosses or our companies are going to pay us. And that's why we go to work day after day. But the point is, when we put our faith in something, when we put our faith in something, our behavior is affected. One way or another, when we put our faith in something, our behavior is affected. We act out our faith. Now, if we don't have much faith, we don't have much faith to act out on. And that's where I think so many of us are in our own daily walks. Put aside the coronavirus, okay? I think that we have very little faith in exercising that faith in our own daily walk. We worry so much about so many things, and I realized, what was it, two weeks ago, I preached on worry. It just so happened that the Lord laid this on my heart tonight, or last night, this morning. But we've got to act out our faith. Not just talk about it. Act it out. Now, if we don't act out our faith, what happens? We act out our fear. And we've seen a world of that, not just in recent days. I've seen people acting out on fear, biggest part of my life, to be honest with you. 
But one way or another, we either act out our faith, we go to church, we be Mr. Goody Goody Two Shoes, and oh, I'm just love the Lord. You've heard me say this a thousand times. But then when it comes to putting our faith into action, we jump immediately into fear. Well, it's not healthy. We need to respect what's going on. And I certainly do. But you're not going to find me wallowing around in fear. Right now, I'm not changing much of what I do. I will clean my hands. Our custodians are making sure that everything here at the church, anything that you touch, is going to be clean and sanitized. We're doing everything we can to help prevent that. And there are necessary steps that we need to take. But aside from all of that, we've got to act out this faith that we claim to have as children of God. Now just imagine, just imagine a world in which car brakes, making reference to what I said earlier, only worked half of the time. We'd be in bad trouble, wouldn't we? We'd go to an intersection, and that would not be good. We'd go around curves and uphills and downhills. Suppose those brakes only worked half of the time. We would be terrified, wouldn't we? But we are told in God's word that God is infinitely more reliable than the finest cars with the finest brakes out there on the market. But we don't treat God that way, do we? We talk about it, but we really don't treat God like he is more reliable than anything else. You said it well in your prayer there, Daniel. You know, whatever problem we're going through, uh, whether it be personally, in our own individual lives, in our homes, in our jobs, out there in the world, there's nothing out there that's bigger than the God we serve. And we can make those problems bigger than our God, but our God is really big, much bigger than all that. But we just, we don't soak up enough of it. We don't have enough faith in him to allow the faith to be stronger and more powerful than the fear. So I think it's a shame that we as Christians, when I say Christians, I'm talking about the whole world of Christians, those that claim to be Christians, that we don't treat God like we really do believe that he is the most reliable thing in all of our lives. Our faith seems to extend just beyond, just a hair beyond our ability. What we can do, we're fine with. But our faith doesn't go much more than that. Even though God is able to do infinitely more than we could ever imagine. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask, all that we think, according to the power at work within us. We hope for good, all of us. We hope for good, but God promises the best. Now, let's think about that. That's the title of my sermon, really. We hope for good, but God promises the best. God can give us the best in everything if we just lean upon him. I think God is telling us, if he's telling us anything right now, Get away from the fear factor. Start believing in who you say you believe in. Start trusting me. That is what God wants us to do. This morning after I got here, I was going over some other reading, and I read the entire chapter of the eighth chapter of Matthew. Remember, there's a lot of workings of God right there. Jesus Christ in the flesh working. And how God was performing miracles. And by the time I got finished with that eighth chapter, I said, oh my goodness, this chapter is just filled with all kind of fulfillment of God's promises and what God can do, what God can do in our own individual lives. Now, if we truly have faith, if we truly have faith that God works in, in all those magnificent ways that we hear about in God's word, 
And that's going to radically change our lives. It will radically change our thinking. It will radically change how we live our lives. We'll be willing to look at our lives, see what needs to be addressed. You know, this is a factor I believe that's very important. One of the reasons that our faith isn't where it needs to be is because there's situations, let me call it what it is, there's sin in our lives. And we can't have that sin in our lives and expect our faith to be exercised the way God wants us to exercise our faith. So we've got to deal with that sin factor and then let God do what only God can do. Let God deal with the healing that needs to take place in our lives. Let God deal with the forgiveness that needs to take place in our lives. And that happens when we yield ourselves in faith, trusting him. In other words, we step out and risk something for God because we know that he will provide it for our needs, whatever those needs may be. And only God knows all the, world, all the needs that are represented right here today let alone out there in the social world. Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, think about that, a good work in you. He began that good work in you when you submitted to him, when you come to know him as your personal Lord and Savior. He began a good work in you. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, a faith like that eliminates that overwhelming fear because faith in the certainty of Jesus Christ always works. Now, let's just stop and think for a moment. When we're not obedient to God's calling, when we're not obedient to God's word and God's wisdom and the things that he's asking us to do, what happens? We doubt the promises of God's word. When we're not obedient, we don't really know what it says. And it's hard for us to live it out. Our, our faith is limited by our need to believe. We are better equipped when we've got God on our side. Managing all the issues in our lives. Fear and faith. Take over when we don't exercise that faith. Have a whole bucket load. Have shelves full of faith. If you're not exercising it, that fear, that failure will overwhelm you. But our faith in him offers freedom from fear. Now, my main passage today, this comes from Joshua, the very first chapter. Have I not commanded you? Now, this is God really speaking. He's really speaking to Joshua. And Joshua was saying this preacher, this message to his people. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Now, hold it. Is there any possibility that God could be telling us the same thing today with whatever we're doing and dealing with in our own lives? Be strong. Be courageous. And do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I need to remind myself, myself of that sometimes. I need to, to know that I can be strong, that I can be discouraged. I don't have to be fearful. I don't have to be frightened. I don't have to be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord God promises to be with me, but it doesn't mean much if I'm not putting that faith into practice putting that faith into action. Our faith is limited by our need to believe. Now see, when I read this from Joshua, I don't see this as, hey, it'll be a really good day if you do this. It's not a suggestion. This is a command. He commands that we have faith, that we be strong, that we be courageous, during those difficult times, during those tedious situations that you have to deal with, did I see a show of hands? 
Is there anybody here that doesn't have a thing in the world to be concerned about and give to God? Is there anybody, anybody here there? All of us have that need. All of us are, I don't care how good life is for you. All of us have to put our faith into practice. God, help me to be courageous. Help me to depend upon you. Help me, Lord, to trust you at your word. The instruction for God, from God, is for us to be strong and courageous. You may think that's impossible at certain times. But when we call upon his name and when we trust him, we will understand the importance and understand the beauty of really knowing him and trusting him. Now, Joshua and the people of Israel sought to conquer the Holy Land, uh, the promised land there, because of their courage. And that was the insight that was given to them. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land and conquer that. If you be strong and you be courageous, remind yourself that I am with you always. You have nothing to be fearful of. But see, they had to place their trust in the Lord in order for that to happen. God had promised them that if you do this, if you do that first part, then I'll be with you. I'll be with you always. Joshua was given this promise, if you recall, when? When did this take place? Well, we get past the Pentateuch there, the first five laws uh, of, of the Old Testament there, and we see Joshua was given these promises when? After Moses, that great servant of the Lord, had already died. And Joshua was able to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. But Joshua had to heed all the instructions that Moses had given him in the book of the law. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate it on it day and night. I wonder what life would be like if we meditated more upon the word of God instead of meditating upon the things that we deal with and the things that we find ourselves so many times we're not meditating upon the word of God day in and, and day out. And because of that, we can't find our way to be prosperous. We can't find that success, that meaning in life. Because we're meditating for all those things that brings us down. Not the things that gives us courage and causes us to be strong. I have commanded you to be strong and be of good courage. Do not tremble, be not, be, be not dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. See, Joshua had to saturate himself in the word of God. He had to meditate upon the promises of God. He had to trust in the truths of God's word. He had to follow his commands. God will be with you. God will give you that strength. God has promised also to be with us during those times of difficulty. Let me uh, wind down by sharing some personal things. You know, this is going to shock some of you, but, but I talk a lot, okay? Some of you might say I talk too much. I really don't care what you think there, but um, I look back at my life and I think about where I was as a little kid. I don't know too many little kids, 11 years old, pedaling their bicycle up a road to milk cows at 3 o'clock in the morning. Wasn't our cows. I was milking for somebody else that owned the dairy farm. But some of you may have heard me tell this. I had a terrible fear growing up. But Karen, you don't count. You cheated this morning. But you know what that fear was? I wasn't afraid of snakes. I wasn't afraid of spiders. I wasn't afraid of mice. I wasn't even afraid of roaches. I, mean, I didn't want a mouse crawling up my leg in the hay barn, as that happened one time. You know what I was afraid of? Anybody want to say? Pardon? 
Cows? No, I wasn't afraid of cows. The darkness. That's right. I was afraid of the dark. Hey, listen. At 3 o'clock in the morning in Tennessee, it's dark. I'm pedaling my bicycle. I thought, oh, man, I'm just so frightful. I don't know what I'm going to do. If a car came up the road, I immediately rode into the ditch. I didn't want them seeing me. I was afraid of what they might do. I'm afraid of the dark. Hey, I'm beginning to make $25 a week milking cows. Then it went up to 35 I can remember making $50 a week milking cows in 1967 or 68. I can remember going and buying shoes that were really nice shoes because I had a job. I thought, hold on, I can't keep this up. I can't keep it up because I am afraid of the dark. And I remember even as a little kid saying, you got to get over that. That's a fear that you can only conquer by giving it to God. And I did. Because not only once I got to the dairy barn, I had to go down in the hall and round up the cows. And at 3.30, it's still dark there. I remember as a little child saying, I, I, I can't do this. I can't live with this. Something has got to change. Either I give up working on the dairy and, and making a few, few dollars there. It seemed like to me like I was a rich kid. Or, or I, I overcome this fear. Well, I continued milking for many years. Even until after high school and two years between high school and college. There was a fear there. And I never was able to overcome that fear until I gave it to God and trusted him. What are your fears right now? Before this coronavirus came up, what were your fears? How did you deal with that? How do you deal with that? And see, if we can learn to give the little things over to God, we can learn to give the big things over to God. Now, I'm not going to be wallowing around in fear. I'm going to continue just doing life until I am led or encouraged to do otherwise. I'm going to continue hugging. I'm going to continue being me. You don't have to hug me. If you don't want to hug me, that's fine. But I'm not going to change my lifestyle when it comes to being who I am. I'm not going to live in that fear. I've given that to God. I'm praying that same surrendering over to God in your life with any of those fears, whatever they might be. Let's pray.